Ladies and gentlemen, there are moments in life when progress is not measured in inventions, patents, or rocket launches, but in the quiet rewiring of a single human heart. When I look back at the most transformative breakthroughs of our species, I don't just see algorithms, equations, or discoveries. I see connection. I see the invisible network of human emotion that underpins every leap in science and technology. And today, I want to talk about one of the most unexpected yet profound discoveries of my life, not found in a laboratory, not born in a boardroom, but revealed through a person. One woman whose influence reached into the mind of one of the most relentless innovators of our age and softened what many believed was unchangeable, the hardest innovator in the world. We often associate innovation with hardness, with an almost superhuman resilience that doesn't break under pressure. Society glorifies the image of the cold genius, detached, analytical, obsessed. But the truth is, even the hardest innovators are still biological beings. Behind the armor of logic, beneath the titanium willpower, lies a neural system that still craves warmth, validation, and safety. Neuroscience tells us that even those who claim to be ruled by intellect are still governed by the same emotional circuits that evolved to ensure survival in a social species. In brain imaging studies of high-performing individuals, leaders, inventors, founders, we see something fascinating. The prefrontal cortex, responsible for logic and decision, making lights up like a city at night. But when the person is exposed to genuine emotional connection, empathy, or love, another region, the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, activates. This part of the brain integrates emotion with reasoning, it allows compassion to coexist with logic. When those two systems synchronize, the human mind becomes capable of not just creating technology, but creating meaning. The man at the center of this story built rockets, cars, neural interfaces. He built dreams. But somewhere along the way, something inside him built walls too. His mind became an engine of relentless optimization. Sleep was expendable, Emotions were distractions, and human softness felt inefficient. Many admired him for that, but neuroscience would call it imbalance, the chronic dominance of the sympathetic nervous system, the fight or flight state turned permanent, and when the brain stays in that mode for too long, empathy fades, the person becomes more efficient, yes, but less human. Then she entered his world, not as a rival, not as a partner in technology, but as something far rarer, an emotional disruptor. She didn't challenge his ideas. She challenged his nervous system. Her presence triggered something that years of success and struggle could not. The simple act of emotional resonance, the mirroring of two nervous systems, began to soften his neurological rigidity. You see, love is not poetry to the brain. It's biochemistry. Oxytocin, serotonin, dopamine. They dance in synchrony, building trust, disarming fear and quieting the hypervigilant amygdala that drives ambition and anxiety alike. What she did was not to teach him, but to regulate him. Her calm became his safety signal. Neuroscientists call this co-regulation. Two people's nervous systems align in real time, sharing states of calm, focus, or even excitement. It's how infants learn to self-soothe, and how adults find balance and connection. When the hardest innovator met someone who could co- regulate with him, who didn't demand he slow down, but instead mirrored his pace with grace. Something shifted. His brain began to reconnect logic with empathy, drive with vulnerability. I remember once observing him during a conversation about failure. Usually, he would analyze it mechanically, treating emotion like a variable to be minimized. But that day, he paused, he said, for the first time, failure doesn't feel like isolation. It feels like a signal that I'm still learning. That statement to a neuroscientist is monumental. It marks the reactivation of the anterior cingulate cortex, the part of the brain that allows pain to translate into growth rather than despair. It's easy to underestimate the power of one human being to change another. We assume change requires strategy, therapy, or trauma, but sometimes all it takes is resonance a moment of being seen deeply enough to awaken the dormant circuits of empathy and curiosity. In this case, one woman, through her quiet consistency, 
her refusal to match chaos with chaos, rewrote the neural code of a man the world thought unchangeable. She reminded him, and through him, reminded all of us, that innovation without empathy is machinery, not legacy. From a scientific standpoint, her influence can be explained by the interplay of mirror neurons. These are the neurons that fire both when we act and when we observe someone else performing the same action. They are the biological basis for empathy, the reason we can feel what others feel. When he watched her approach stress not with aggression, but with grace, his mirror neurons learned a new behavioral algorithm. Slowly, the conditioned response of fight or freeze began to transform into engage and adapt. This transformation wasn't dramatic. It didn't happen overnight. It unfolded in micro moments, a soft tone after a harsh day, a silent understanding instead of critique, the way she didn't interrupt his long monologues, but waited for the emotion beneath the logic to surface. In those moments, the brain's neuroplasticity took over, old pathways of defense weakened, and new circuits of openness strengthened. It's fascinating. The hardest innovators often build external systems of control because internally they've lost regulation. When a person is trapped in the constant pursuit of progress, their nervous system interprets stillness as danger. They become addicted to chaos because chaos feels like life. And so they seek constant motion, projects, crises, launches, anything to avoid the unbearable stillness that reveals the self. But she, through her quiet patience, made stillness feel safe again. That is the rarest kind of power. As neuroscientists, we often speak of neuroplasticity as the brain's ability to change in response to experience. But what we forget is that relationships are the most potent form of experience. You can meditate, train, or biohack your brain, but one genuine connection can rewire what a thousand self-help books cannot. That's what happened here. Through human connection, a new kind of intelligence emerged, emotional intelligence grounded in biology. For the first time, the innovator began to understand that emotional safety is not the opposite of ambition. It is its foundation. You cannot sustain creation in a state of chronic stress. The brain simply burns out. But when you are emotionally regulated, you enter what neuroscientists call the optimal zone, a state where focus, creativity, and empathy coexist. It's the same state elite athletes enter during flow. Only now this man was entering it through love. The world noticed the difference before he did. His tone changed in interviews. His pauses grew longer, more reflective. The sharp edges in his responses softened. He began to speak about humanity again, not just technology. The language of machines gave way ever so slightly to the language of meaning. And yet, he never spoke about her. He didn't need to. Her influence was not meant for public display. It lived in his neurological rhythm, in the way his brain now balanced the drive for innovation with the capacity for empathy. To understand the depth of this transformation, consider a simple truth. The human brain cannot simultaneously sustain chronic defensiveness and deep creativity. The same limbic circuits that protect us from danger also block us from curiosity. By soothing his threat response, she reactivated his capacity for wonder. In many ways, she became his mirror, not of who he was, but of who he could be if he stopped fighting everything that couldn't be controlled. That's the paradox of innovation. The harder we push to change the world, the more rigid our own inner world can become. But she reminded him that progress is not born from force, it's born from connection. When the brain feels safe, it opens. When it opens, it learns. When it learns, it evolves. And that evolution, that softening, was perhaps the most revolutionary act of his life. And as that evolution deepened, it began to manifest not only in his mind, but in the systems he built around him. For years, his leadership model had been rooted in the physics of control. Every variable calculated, every inefficiency eliminated. But as his internal wiring changed, so too did the way he led. People around him began to notice a subtle shift meetings that once felt like battles now felt like collaborations. Criticism turned into curiosity, where once he demanded perfection, he now encouraged exploration. In neuroscience, we call this emotional transference. 
When a leader's nervous system transitions from defensive rigidity to regulated openness, that state cascades through teams like an unseen contagion. Mirror neurons synchronize not only in pairs, but across entire groups. This creates what researchers term collective coherence, a neurological resonance shared among people working toward a unified goal. What this woman had awakened in him rippled through hundreds, then thousands of minds. He didn't become softer in a way that weakened his vision. He became softer in a way that made his vision more human. And that's an important distinction. Because in the mythology of innovation, we often mistake hardness for strength. We think detachment protects focus. That vulnerability invites chaos. But neuroscience paints a different picture. The most adaptive brains are not the hardest. They're the most flexible. They oscillate between drive and rest, between analysis and empathy. They are able to feel deeply without drowning, to think broadly without detaching. And she, without ever giving a lecture or making a demand, had modeled that flexibility perfectly. Her brain had become the tuning fork his nervous system needed. Every time he entered a state of overwhelm, she provided the frequency of calm. Gradually, his neurons began to mirror hers. His amygdala, once hyper-reactive, began to relax. The prefrontal cortex regained control. The heart rate variability, a key marker of emotional resilience, increased. Science would describe this as physiological entrainment, but on a human level, it's something much simpler he felt safe enough to feel again. There's a story that illustrates this change better than any data point. It was late, past midnight, and his team had just faced a catastrophic test failure. Millions lost, months wasted. Everyone expected the usual response, anger, blame, the storm of frustration that used to follow any setback. But this time, something was different. He walked into the room, looked at the exhausted faces, and said quietly, It's okay. We'll learn faster this way. No one spoke for a moment. The silence was disbelief. It wasn't weakness, it was balance. He understood, perhaps for the first time, that leadership isn't about eliminating error. It's about creating safety in its aftermath. That moment marked a turning point not just for his company, but for his evolution as a human being. Emotional safety doesn't make us less ambitious. It makes us more innovative. When the brain feels safe, it's not defending, it's exploring. That's when new ideas surface, unexpected connections form, creativity flourishes. He had spent his life engineering systems to optimize performance, but it took one woman to show him that the ultimate optimization begins within. She had, in effect, become the quiet scientist of his soul. Not by diagnosing him, not by changing him, but by embodying the stability he lacked. It's something we often overlook emotional regulation is not taught. It's transmitted. We learn calmness through proximity to calm people, just as we learn chaos through exposure to chaos. She didn't tell him to slow down. She simply lived in such a way that made stillness contagious. It's astonishing what happens when a brain that's lived in survival mode suddenly experiences genuine peace. Neurochemically, the default mode network, the system active during rest and introspection, begins to re-engage. Creative imagination surges. The boundaries between analytical and emotional thought begin to blur. That's when breakthroughs occur, not just technological ones, but personal ones. He started to see connections he had missed before, between engineering and empathy, between neural networks and human relationships, between the architecture of rockets and the architecture of trust. For him, love became not an emotion, but an operating system, one that optimized not for efficiency, but for wholeness. I remember once he said, I used to think love made you slower. Now I realize it makes you infinite. That's not poetry. That's neuroscience. The dopaminergic system, the one responsible for motivation, is directly enhanced by oxytocin when trust and affection are present. In other words, love doesn't replace ambition. It refines it. It removes the noise of fear and amplifies purpose. What she taught him, without ever meaning to, is that connection isn't a distraction from greatness. It is greatness. This story is not just about one woman or one man. 
It's about what happens when two nervous systems meet at the right frequency. When the hardest mind finds its match not in intellect, but in empathy. When the pursuit of progress finally collides with the power of presence. He once said that building a civilization on Mars was his greatest goal. But what if his true legacy was something quieter? The reprogramming of his own humanity. What if the greatest frontier isn't in the stars, but in the heart? Every human being in this room, no matter how rational or ambitious, has neural circuits wired for connection. You can suppress them, numb them, even deny them, but you cannot delete them. They are the original code of our species. And when someone enters your life who activates those circuits again, everything changes. She didn't soften him by convincing him to be softer. She did it by being the one person whose calm couldn't be conquered, whose love wasn't transactional, whose steadiness didn't collapse under the weight of his intensity. And that, paradoxically, is what melted the armor he'd spent years perfecting. From a scientific lens, this is co-evolution in action. Two brains, two nervous systems, synchronizing over time until each becomes a mirror and a teacher to the other. Her empathy taught his logic how to breathe. His drive taught her patience how to expand. Together, they created a new balance. The fusion of the human and the visionary, the emotional and the mechanical. And it makes you wonder, how many innovators, leaders, or creators might change the world more gently, more profoundly, if they too found someone who could anchor them back into their own humanity? We don't need more hard geniuses. We need integrated ones. Minds that can think beyond the self without losing the self. Because the future won't be built by the strongest, but by the most connected. The innovations that endure are not the coldest. They're the most compassionate. A technology that serves without empathy is a machine. A technology born from love is an ecosystem. And that is the hidden legacy of this story. It isn't about romance. It's about evolution, neural, emotional, and human. The woman who softened the world's hardest innovator didn't do it through persuasion or control. She did it through presence. Presence, that rare, undistracted state of being fully with another person, is one of the most healing forces known to neuroscience. It slows time. It synchronizes breathing. It aligns heart rhythms. It makes the brain believe, perhaps for the first time, that it is safe enough to be itself. And when the mind feels safe to be itself, genius stops being a shield and becomes a gift. He didn't lose his edge. He refined it. He didn't stop pushing boundaries. He began to understand why they mattered. And that understanding, that fusion of intellect and empathy, might just be the most important innovation of his life. So, what can we take from this? That the next great leap in human progress won't come from faster machines or smarter code. It will come from softer hearts and stronger connections. The revolution ahead isn't technological. It's relational. And maybe that's the irony of progress. After all the rockets, algorithms, and artificial minds, the real frontier still lives in the same place it always has, between one heartbeat and another. Ladies and gentlemen, the world's hardest innovator was never truly hardened. He was just waiting for the right frequency to remind him that beneath all our logic, all our ambition, all our invention, we are still beautifully human. And sometimes, it takes just one person, one woman, to prove that even the toughest steel can remember what it feels like to be warm.